<laughs> okay, right around here we have the Celebration Choir Fan Club. <laughs> so cool. I feel like I was at a concert. It's fun, fun, fun. All right, let's talk. I get, uh, you know, I, I have all these reminders as where to put them. All right. A miracle. What the world is it? So I had to look it up on the, in the dictionary, and, well, I did. And <laughs> it is a surprising and welcome event. Surprising. How many of you have had surprising, unwelcome events? It's the other one. It's the other surprising event. A surprising and welcome event that is not... It's inexplicable. No, it says here, just explicable. Okay. I said, I'm looking at it with an E. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so Oxford had it wrong. But anyway, it's, it was, it's not unexplainable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. Whoa. <laughs> it's also highly improbable or an extraordinary event or development or accomplishment that brings very welcome consequences. That's, that's what we're talking about. Got it? Let's have more. But let's try it out. Let's just start here. How many of you have had one of those welcome kind? Surprising. Look at you! I love, oh my goodness, second service is so wonderful. You wouldn't believe first service. I mean, I had to really talk about it. They raised their hands eventually. I think they're just spiritually humble. And that they walked on water all the way here and then they said, no big deal. I don't know. But anyway, thank you for being so outrageously. I've had one of those. My goal is that you have them more often. My goal is that you have them in big and small ways because those are just... How do I want to say this? They are the evidence that something greater than yourself is intimately involved in your life. You're not alone. You're not here to do this by yourself. You've got backup. But there's the theory of backup and there's the demonstration of backup. Miracles are demonstrations of backup. They are evidence that something cares and is involved and it cares in the small things and the large things. I mean, I heard once that there's no atheists in a foxhole. I heard that there was no atheists in an intensive care unit. Well, guess what? I don't want any atheists walking around. I, want, I don't want to be the atheist. I want to believe that, that my, needs are, uh, my needs are cared for and cared about as I go through my day, my week, my year, my life. And that, ooh, and before I call, I will answer. Before I call, I will answer. Like you think a thing and there it is. You think a thing and there it is. That's possible. That's what today's talk's about. That the, what is possible becomes probable. And, ex, and it's an expectation. I'll give you an idea before you call, I will answer. There's someone in this room who wants to expand their business doing really good, wants to expand their business. They're just thinking about, you know, I'd really like to expand my business, but I can't, I don't have the means to expand my business right now, but I'd really like to expand it. Someone that's a customer, a client, said, you know what? You do such good work, I want to invest in you expanding your business. I expect a miracle every day. God will make a way out of no way. I mean, that's the way it could be. How about that? Here's another example of a miracle. I'm, then I'm going to tell you how to get there, but first I've got to like, get you excited about it. 
I, under, I had undergone, this just came to me last week, I had undergone an expensive medical procedure that I was, to, I was told would be covered by medical insurance. Afterward, I received messages from my insurance company that it was not covered and that I was responsible for the entire amount. amount. So I checked with the insurance company and they confirmed it again. See, I love this. They're doing their due diligence. They get a letter, then they check in. You know, this, see, some people think, some people are afraid to check because they don't want confirmation that it's not going to happen. Not this person. Okay. Then I reached out to my doctor's office, and it appeared uncertain. Uh, it, it, I guess the office. The office talked. Anyway, the doctor's office, and it appeared uncertain why I was told that the procedure would be covered. I then asked them to appeal it for me, and they agreed. After that, I basically forgot about it and trusted in spirit. Guess what? It ended up being totally covered. Now, what I want to say about this is because I, I'm, list, I'm the nuance here. They did what they needed to do. They did the due diligence. They proceeded. They asked. But they depended upon spirit. So the first two re, you know, answers to their questions were no and no. They asked again, and they depended upon spirit until, yes, we will cover this. Do you see the difference? Now, that's, that's the kind of life that I think we can have. There was someone that, uh, that wants me to talk about something in Money Mastery, and so I'm just going to talk about it to you because I think this is important. She said, I'm a certain age, and even though I don't look my age, when I apply for jobs because I still need to work, they don't hire me because of my age. When they ask my age, and I thought, like, they, well, but they can't ask your age. But anyway, um, <laughs> at least not in Washington. But here's the deal. I said, you need to go over their head. You work for God. And God will find you employment. Do you see? A lot of times we put our attention on, it has to come this way. They've got to say yes. They've got to do this. It's, we see the looking outside. No, look at the invisible that can cause something to happen in the visible. That's miracle-mindedness. That's expecting a good result even if you've been told something else. Because you put God as first in your life. So, how do you do that? Oh, by the way, a lot of people have, uh, well, it's all wrapped up together because this is actually the fourth in a, in a, four, in a five series of talks about thriving. The first is to have a hope. But it's really hard to have hope if you don't think that there's anything to back up that hope. Do you see how it's all connected? But you start with hope, then you build your faith, and you've and also, I've talked about this, we already have faith, you just gotta shift faith. See, a lot of people have faith in it not working out. A lot of people have faith that, well, you know, they said no, and so they don't, and they, so they have faith in their doubts. How many of you have faith in your doubts? Doubt comes up and you go, oh, uh, oh, oh, doubt. Or your fears. This is what I fear will happen. I mean, and so you were, we're like, we go into our primitive animal, animal nature, fear, and we do fight or flight or freeze which is not helpful. But we can shift our faith into what we hope for. Hope should lead faith. And then we set intentions. And we're not going to set an intention if we don't listen to our hope and have faith that it'll happen. Then we can set our intentions. That was last week. And now we become miracle-minded, which means we, we become receptive to something greater happening than what we can make happen. We become receptive. 
It's just making welcome. That's miracle-minded. You're not making anything happen. You're just like, I bet, it, I bet something greater, better, better, better can happen. I'll tell you another story because you need to hear these. Because have you noticed that a lot of religions, churches, talk about how you need to be so God loves you? So I need to be so that God will take care of you. Need to be so you can finally be on God's side. You know, how big is God that everybody could be on its side? I mean, think about it. Circumference. I just, I'm going to be by the side of God. Anyway, telling us how we should be, how we should n not, not do this and do this and decrease this and increase this. It's like, no. What we teach is make welcome the grace of God that's happening anyway. Just make welcome the grace of God. So we shift our attention and we don't listen to our fears anymore and we allow, we allow ourselves to become miracle-minded. Which, by the way, we need to drop those fears. See, I found out that one of the most used phrases in the Bible... In fact, it's, you, it's in the Bible uh, 360 times is fear not. It's really hard for spirit to work through fear. So we drop the fear. We put our faith in our hopes. And, and I think the reason that I want to tell stories over and over again is so that you can see that it works. And if it works, it always works because God doesn't play favorites. If anyone's had a miracle, everyone can have a miracle. If any of you had an experience of, wow, that worked out well, it can always work out well. Do you see? It's like, it's not one and done. Well, you had yours. <laughs> Don't be greedy. <laughs> You're on your own, but I'm sure you'll do okay. I mean, how many of you have had that subtle thought in your head? Just a few of you. Oh, come on, this is second service. You're usually bolder than that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. All right. So, how do we become miracle-minded? <sighs> First, we become optimistic. And I had to... I had, this is so good. I just, I just had to read this for you. Because this is done through a study. I love studies. I love studies that prove what spiritual centers have been saying all over the place. Not religious centers. Not the ones that say, do this, don't do this. But the ones that say, you have a spiritual nature and spirit is there to provide for you. That kind of thing. So here's a study. A new study finds that men and women with the highest levels of optimism, because first we need to develop optimism, had a 11 to 15% longer lifespan than the average person. Whoa! Just, just being optimistic, you get years. So therefore, it's good that God is your source because, you know, we've got more years going, right? Okay. Then, um, optimism is one important psychological dimension that, is, that has emerged as showing real interest by uh, scientists in, the, in association with health. Isn't that nice? Isn't that good? They also found that tw only 25% of optimism was uh, genetic. It's like I didn't even know that optimism could be genetic. Like, where, where's the gene? <laughs> I, I mean, I'd really like, and this little gene here is optimism. Sorry, you don't have one. But anyway. <laughs> But luckily, it's only 25%. And so you've got 75% chance of, of developing your optimism. And if it did nothing else, it will help you live longer. But it will also allow, allow you to be more miracle-minded. Because you're going to see possibility as opposed to problem. You're going to see probability as opposed to just give up now. Take what you can get. Find the money for the procedure, whatever. Ways, they, then they also say ways to develop your optimism. 
This is stuff that has been taught in so many spiritual books. It's amazing. First of all, gratitude. How many times have we heard that? We're going to spend the whole month in November on gratitude. Well, obviously that was a good choice. <laughs> Glad to know. <laughs> I love it. We have the cheerleaders for the, for the, you know, the fan club for the choir and, and, and gratitude. Yeah. yeah, gratitude. Yes, okay. Okay, let's once a year and then we're over with it. Okay, so, no, <laughs> no. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. And one of the ways they say to build, develop gratitude is to journal on the good stuff. I, I'm a journaler. I get through so much by journaling. To just write my thoughts down and see them on paper helps me get the chatter out of my mind. But one of the things I also try to write about is what I'm grateful for and the good stuff that's happening. Because oftentimes it's in people's nature to put our attention on what's not working and try to dissect it and fix it. Well, how about appreciating and marveling at what is going right. Wouldn't that be lovely? And then there's something that I want to add because this comes out of Ernest Holmes. He said that positive thinking is one thing, but it's more powerful if you realize that you're thinking positively, not about an outcome, but about the wholeness behind the outcome. That's like those people, that, that woman who said, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to address this insurance company. I'm going to go back to the office. They told me no. I'm going to ask them to do it again. But she trusted spirit. Optimism in what spirit can do. Not opti and, and it doesn't mean that we negate what's happening on the ground. We're not negating that people are involved. I, I, I'm like, I, my horse had some injections because she's, she's 20, which means, I don't know, something like 65 years old, and she's getting arthritis. But it's so wonderful what vets can do now with just injections. It's like, wow, she won't be in pain like by, by, the, next, by the end of this week because they're going to regenerate her joints. I mean, like, What? And all I can think of is the Spirit of God caring for a creation working through scientists and veterinarians and doctors. Like, wow, there's that. And I appreciate that, but I want even beyond that. Does that make sense? Because sometimes where we are, either medically or scientifically, we're at the edge of what humans can do, and then... But we then look at what's behind that. What's the Spirit doing through that? <sighs> that is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That consciousness is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. House in the Bible always meant consciousness. Dwell in what God can do forever. Dwell in what God can do. I mean, yeah, this is happening, but what can God do? Someone was, someone was in first service, and they were sitting right about there. And I looked over at them, and I had to tell their story because they told the story. They're so excited about the story. They were told they had to have surgeries. They had a, a problem. I don't know what it was, but they needed to take it out. And she was praying, and she had her sangha and her prayer group praying. And they prayed and prayed, and she just knew everything was okay. But she was scheduled, and she was going to do the surgery, and she, and she was actually feeling sorry for the surgeon. And she said, are you going to feel bad if you go in and don't find anything? <laughs> she said that. And he said, we're, we're going to find something. Guess what? Nothing. Nothing. Because she was using the highest human wisdom she could at the time, but there was something even greater. We don't not use accountants 
We don't not use doctors. I, I call the vet. But there's something even greater that's dwelling in the consciousness of the Lord forever. That's dwelling in this thing that there's something even bigger going on than what we can make up. I told, I've, I've told this story before, but I even had a, a, a different experience because I too had something that needed to be removed. And I too took, I took three months off and said, I'm just praying. And I got to the place where I was so buzzed on God. I mean, like I was buzzed on God. I would be sitting in my backyard going, whoa, grass. <laughs> I mean, truly. And it was way before anything was legal around here. <laughs> it's like, whoa. I was dwelling in the house of the Lord, the consciousness of God. And I was scheduled for surgery on Monday, and on Friday I was to go in and have my pre-check. And I told the surgeon, remember I took those three months off, and I was going to work on things, and you were going to check things before you cut me open? Because it was going to be a big cut, because it was a big thing. It was a big cut. Not a little tiny thing. It was a little thingy thing. Said, no, no, big, big, big. Anyway. <laughs> and, and she said, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So she, she took me in and gave me an ultrasound and found nothing. She said, get out of here. You're making me believe. <laughs> Literally, she said, get out of here. You're making me believe. Well, sorry about that. <laughs> Things could be worse. Do you see how this stuff works? I'm telling you this because I, I, you all are facing stuff. You're facing big things, little things. You're facing things with your family. You're facing things with your finances. You're facing things with your health. You're facing things with your age. There's stuff happening. But there's something behind you that's got you. And is only waiting for you to be in alignment with it and dwell in that consciousness of wholeness. And then let the good times roll. And have it be something that can happen over and over and over again. Because I've experienced having a miracle in my teens when I was a born-again Christian. And I, I had prayed for four years. Four years of high school, I prayed for one thing. I wanted one thing. And guess what? I got it. I became the Emerald Empire Rodeo Queen. <laughs> I'd wanted it all my life. And I prayed. I was a good Christian. And I said, this is the only thing I'll ever pray for for myself. Because you weren't supposed to pray for yourself. And I said, God, just one little thing, just one little thing. You know, I've prayed for others. I've been good. I've converted people. I've got stars in my crown. And uh, <sighs> I deserve one thing. And I got that one thing, even though I didn't have a horse and I wasn't popular. And I don't even know how they got in there. But anyway, it's okay. God can work a miracle every day. <laughs> But here's the deal. After that weekend, after that rodeo, I was so depressed because I thought I'd had my one miracle. I did. I figured God could give you a miracle, but you shouldn't be greedy. And I'd had mine. And I thought, I'm only 18. I am on my own for the rest of my life. That's not the way it works. It's a self-generating prophecy that when you see a miracle, more will happen when you see a miracle. Whether you hear about it from someone else or you recognize it and acknowledge it in your own life. It's the beginning. It's the seed. So instead of like having this one little flower of a miracle, oh, I love that miracle. It's so wonderful. No, it is the beginning of a forest of thriving in your life. You were created to thrive because that's what life does. And you are the life of God taking form. And anything less is denying the spirit and the power and the will of God for your good. God wills your good. Greater than you can will. You, you know, I, people, I have so many people, I don't want to will to will God's will. I mean, I've been there. I thought it would send me to India as a missionary. <laughs> I don't want to go there. 
So now I just go and stay in palaces. But anyway, <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? God's will for us is so much greater. Whew. Let's pray. So we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We will dwell and the consciousness of fullness and wholeness and completeness forever. We will dwell in the consciousness of good for all kind forever. We will dwell in the consciousness of solutions. We will dwell in the consciousness of healing. We will dwell in the consciousness of love. We will dwell in the consciousness of creativity. That is God's will for us. And I give thanks that together as a community, we say yes. And so it is. <laughs>